Hi everybody, it's Dr. Lisa Fitzpatrick, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm an infectious diseases physician and a CDC-trained medical epidemiologist. So I have been uh, following what's happening with COVID quite a bit. I've been engaged in the community and hearing lots of questions. There's a lot of confusion about COVID. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about some of the, some of the most common questions I'm hearing uh, about COVID. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk about, um, I, I want to acknowledge the people who are working on the front lines and uh, particularly the nurses and doctors in the emergency rooms and the ICUs who are taking care of COVID patients. But also there's a hidden group of people um, you may not know about, um, even though I think our um, public health leadership uh, in this pandemic in the United States has been disastrous. I'll just say that out front, uh, up front. But there are a group of people who I know are on the ground all around the world and people don't know about them. They're called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. I was a part of this uh, public health corps many years ago. And even though you don't hear about them, I know they're out there working very hard on this epidemic. So I want to acknowledge them as well. Um, I also want you to know one of the most common questions I get is about how do I know if I have COVID? That's a tricky one. We know the most common symptoms are cough, fever, and shortness of breath. But as this pandemic wears on, we're hearing uh, different symptoms. Um, sometimes people just feel tired. Um, they may not have a fever. Um, some people have been reporting diarrhea. Uh, there's a loss of sense of smell, which is a really unique finding. Um, and it's hay fever season, so that can also confuse things a bit. But usually, hay fever or allergy symptoms involve uh, runny, runny eyes, runny nose, stuffy nose sometimes, lots of post-nasal drip, which can make you cough. And I had to worry about whether or not I might have COVID because I'm an allergy sufferer. And a few weeks ago, I started coughing, and, but I didn't have a fever, which is one of the hallmark symptoms uh, of COVID. So I uh, just want to take a minute to check in and uh, see who's with us. I appreciate um, you all being out there. Uh, some of my old classmates from the Kennedy School. Hi, Chad, my cousin, Elizabeth, Vivica, I haven't seen you in a while, Maylene. Um, I won't stop in and um, say hi to everybody. I'll go through um, the information and then see if you have questions. And if I don't get to you, then uh, please leave your information uh, in, the, in the chat below so that I can get back to you. Um, if you have questions that I don't cover, I'm happy to follow up with you after. Uh, so everybody just come on in and sorry, I won't take the time to acknowledge you, but um, I don't want this to be a long chat. I want to get through the questions and see what questions you have. Um, so the, the first question, uh, first, first common question is how is coronavirus spread? And there's a little bit of confusion here because some people are saying, oh, it's only spread by, uh, it's spread in the air. Um, it's spread by what we call respiratory droplets. So if someone sneezes or coughs, the germs will come flying out if they don't cover their, their cough or their sneeze, which is why we've really been reinforcing the need for covering your cough, um, using a tissue, not shaking hands because the germs will be on your hands and they can be transmitted to other devices, particularly your phone, doorknobs, anything that's steel or metal, the virus can hang around uh, for a few hours. I've gotten a lot of questions about, is it okay to touch the mail? Um, and uh, what about um, groceries or when you go into the grocery store? Those are not thought to be high risk areas, but again, if you're, if you're practicing good hand hygiene, um, washing your hands and you don't have to use anything special. Soap and water is really the best, uh, but hand, um, hand sanitizers are also good, but I really encourage you to wash your hands with soap and water. 
this is also a great time. I noticed we can uh, de finally develop a habit of not touching our faces. It's such a common and human thing to do to touch your face. Um, but I think we're all trying to be more mindful about that now. And maybe it'll become a habit. And the next thing you know, we will not be touching our faces very often. The next question I get a lot is about, should I be tested? See, I just scratched my nose. Do you see? The, should I be tested? There's a lot of confusion about who should be tested. But let me give you the backstory. The reason why there's even a question about whether or not you should be tested is because we failed at testing in the very beginning of this epidemic. When an outbreak happens, normally what you do is you find all the cases and you find them by testing them. And once you find the people who are positive, you isolate them. So you get them out of circulation away from other people and then you find out who they've been around and then you go and test those people and get those positives out of circulation and that's how you contain the spread. We didn't do that. We knew about this. Our federal government, uh, public health officials knew about this in January, even though the virus had been spreading in China for many weeks. I saw something today saying that the first case, one of the first cases in Wuhan, China was December 10th. So if you think about how long the virus has been spreading before we actually uh, publicized it here, but even then, if we had tested enough people, if we had blanketed places like New York, Washington, California with testing to find the positives, we could have contained this outbreak. But since we didn't do that, and we haven't had enough tests, the healthcare workers on the front lines are running out of masks, gloves, gowns. These are, this is called personal protective equipment, so PPE. So if we don't have enough PPE, every time someone gets tested, you have to use PPE, which is, since we have a limited supply of PPE, Everyone can't get tested because there won't be enough. And this is why we're seeing a shortage of PPE in New York City. So if you think you have COVID, but you're not short of breath, having difficulty breathing, um, if you are not having profound fatigue, many people with COVID, and remember up to 85 or 90% of people who get COVID do fine. You may feel lousy, like you have the flu or a bad cold, but we are asking because we don't have enough supplies in some of these areas to stay home, isolate yourself, and ride the wave. Unfortunately, that's what, it, that's what we have to do now because of the situation we're in. But if you feel that you're profoundly short of breath, you can't catch air, you have to go and be seen by a healthcare provider. So I'm, I know that's still probably a lot of questions about that, so make sure you leave them below. And again, if I can't get to the questions, uh, I will definitely follow up uh, after the chat. Um, the other question I get a lot is, can I leave the house? Yes, you can leave your house. Go outside as long as you're practicing social distancing. And what's so magic about social distancing, this six feet it's because when someone coughs or sneezes, the germs can fly out to six feet. But usually it's, it's shorter than that, generally three to four feet. And the droplets may hang in the air for a few seconds before they fall to the ground. But if you're beyond six feet from that person, you're not, you're, you're not at risk of contracting the infection. So I see a lot of people not practicing social distancing right now. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I've been out in the neighborhood quite a bit. And I think um, there, there are some people who don't really believe this is an issue. And we need people to take this seriously because we can avoid being like New York. If your state has not been hit like New York, please reach out to your public health officials and let them know that you demand that they acquire the testing you need to find people who are positive isolate them and do the contact tracing I was discussing earlier because that's how we avoid becoming New York. 
why are people hoarding toilet paper? Toilet paper, Dr. Lisa. <laughs> the toilet paper has nothing to do with coronavirus. The this is a this is what I call a proxy for something else. The toilet paper hoarding represents fear. It represents um, concerns about scarcity, not being able to have enough. The challenge with that is we're not being community minded when we're hoarding because the shelves are empty. And what about the people who don't have anything if we're hoarding? I know it's difficult to to get all this information coming at you. We're bombarded with information and it's scary. But there are other ways for us to cope with this. We can lean on lean on our friends and family. Um, we can exercise, move. Uh, maybe you saw my dance video. If you didn't see it, I'm gonna invite you to look at it. Um, maybe it'll give you a little inspiration. I also invite you to um, go to YouTube and watch some of the Dr. Lisa videos and give me some feedback about those. Um, but take deep breaths. Um, there's a lot, this is a very stressful time and it will pass. Um, it's, it's very scary right now, but we're hoping that coronavirus will be seasonal. And as it warms, uh, we may see a reduction in the vitality of this virus, the viral fitness, we call it. But I don't know if that's true because there are some warm, warm climates. Uh, Singapore comes to mind, Australia, they have cases of coronavirus, so I don't know. So it's really up to us to practice basic public health hygiene. Not touching your face, watching your, washing your hands, not going out and being in close proximity if you're sick, practicing social distancing. I also get people asking me, how long will this go on, Dr. Lisa? I don't know. But as I mentioned, you, we are all in control of what happens now. Since the government failed us in the beginning, we didn't have enough tests. We didn't treat this like every other public health investigation or outbreak. But it's not too late. So let's see. If you have questions, I know a lot of you have logged on since I started talking and um, hi, I can't uh, get to everybody because I didn't want to make this a long chat. And this is my first chat because people were telling me, oh, you should go on live. Everybody's looking at live. I actually do not like uh, this kind of interaction. Uh, if you, those of you who know me well know that I prefer uh, <laughs> the person-to-person -person connection. So I want to hear back from you. Uh, and this, this mode doesn't work that well for me. Um, I used to teach distance learning, and I had to give that up because I didn't like the lack of person-to-person uh, -person interaction. But anyway, um, we'll make the best of it. So um, thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's so, wow, people I haven't seen in such a long time. Ife, Sheila, Moran. Oh my goodness, you're taking me way back to high school. Um, so I will do this again, but please leave your feedback um, in the comments below um, as things evolve. And as you know, this situation is very dynamic. It's changing constantly. Um, and some of you weren't on in the beginning. I'm an infectious diseases doctor and I trained in public health at the CDC. And I'm so frustrated by the CDC response and the lack of uh, broad availability of testing in the beginning because that would have avoided this fiasco. Um, but it's not too late if you're in a state where we don't see a lot of spread. Talk to your public health officials and your political officials to get the testing you need to test folks and figure out who's, who's positive and follow the public health principles we've been talking about. So I'm gonna sign off and I'll look through these, the questions later and try and follow up. And I'll let you know when I'll be back on um, Facebook Live. That wasn't too bad for my first time. Bye.